I want to speak to you today on the subject of what I believe to be the most important prophecy that Jesus ever gave. The most important prophecy that Jesus ever gave. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. And I want to begin reading at verse 13. And I want to read most of this passage. And so we'll read beginning at 13 and going down through verse 19. There the Bible says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Pause right there. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? For at this time, Jesus is just starting to really grow in incredible popularity. It's at this stage of his ministry we know from history and from the Bible that crowds are now beginning to follow him in mass almost everywhere he goes. The Bible tells us because of his signs and wonders and miracles that people followed him. But they've gone from small crowds to massive crowds and it's making the religious hierarchy quite nervous because he's become more popular than any of them or their honor students from the temple. And they're asking in these circles, who is this man? So Jesus pulls his 12 out of social context and asks them individually and specifically, who do people say that the Son of Man is, verse 14. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Pause again. The things of God cannot be given to you in a university or a college or even in some seminaries. The things of the Spirit, especially the deep things of the Spirit, can only be revealed to you by the Holy Tutor of Heaven, whom is the Holy Spirit. The Bible said the Spirit of the Lord will guide you into all truth. Some of you didn't do well in school. Some of you didn't do well in college. Some of you didn't have the qualifications to even get into a college. Some of you that are listening may not even have a high school diploma. But you may feel inferior intellectually, but you listen to this preacher on the Lord's Day. No matter who you are academically, from a PhD to no HD, the Holy Spirit can take you today save you, fill you with the Holy Ghost and quicken your mind and the Bible says in the book of James if anybody lacks wisdom let them ask of God who gives to everybody liberally and upbraideth not. The Holy Spirit can cause you to have a higher IQ than those who teach at the local university. When you get saved, you'll become smarter because the Holy Spirit will be your teacher from the day of your salvation until the Lord calls you home. <laughs> Lift a hand to heaven and say, Father, I receive it in the name of Jesus. You did not learn this from any human being. 
Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it, and I will give you the keys. If you're taking notes, keys in the Bible, when spoken by Christ, always refers to spiritual authority. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. When God saves you, fills you with the Holy Spirit, and adopts you into his glorious family, he gives to you a spiritual authority that the world doesn't understand the world doesn't have and the world cannot take away. But every blood-washed child of Jesus Christ has an authority. You may not be walking in it yet, but faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17 tells us that. And the more you sit under anointed men and women of God, who start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible, as the word of God gets implanted into your spirit, the authority of the Lord will begin to come out of you like breathing in and out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you that it's as anointed today as when as you spoke it when it was written. Now by the Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us in these moments. My prayer is that not one person within the sound of my voice will be left behind when Christ returns. Not one person will be lost in eternity. Not one person will stand before God and meet him as a God of wrath and judgment. But they may come to know you through personal choice as their heavenly father. I bind every power of sin that would keep them in bondage. I loose every captive and set them free by that authority of Christ. And I pray that all within the sound of my voice and the preaching of the gospel would feel the drawing and the liberty to say yes to Jesus. When I give the invitation in the moments to come, give them the faith and the courage and the humility to do what they ought to do. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. One of the things that I have seen like never before in my 42 plus years of ministry, I preached the gospel and held crusades in over 56 countries of the world, most of them third world. But I've seen a growing discouragement, fear, anxiety, despondency, and not just in the secular world, but sadly, many in the church. I've read the reports recently of surveys of how many preachers have quit the ministry in the last year, and it's an unprecedented number in comparison to recent numbers. People are afraid. People are trying to live every day as if everything's going to get back to normal, but down deep in their heart, many are anxious because they don't know what the future holds. And especially in recent months in our own nation, people are beginning to wonder, when is it going to stop? How bad are things going to be? How many genders are they going to invent? How high is gas going to go? A sheet of plywood the other day at the lumber store, $99 for a sheet of plywood. Grocery prices escalating like we haven't seen in de decades. And people are beginning to wonder when does this spiral stop? Why are they attacking conservatives? Why are they attacking Christians? Why are they inventing laws trying to call people who believe in the Bible extremists? 
Why are the heads of social media trying to wash out every voice except liberal voices? Why are they trying to silence the First Amendment? Why are they threatening to come to my home and violate the Second Amendment? And people have legitimate questions. Well, I have something I want to bring to your attention today in case you're one of those that has wrestled with despondency either full-time or part-time. What you are watching in our nation, in Canada and around the world, is not a political battle. It is not a battle between Democrats and Republicans. It is not a battle between liberals and conservatives. It is not a battle of trying to decide what social end of the spectrum we need to stand upon. What you are watching is the fulfillment of final Bible prophecy and it is a literal war between heaven and hell. It is a literal tug of war between righteousness and unrighteousness and the good news is, is righteousness always prevails. And this week, perhaps like never before in your Christian walk, I believe God wants to help us to open up the Bible and through the lens and the authenticity of Bible prophecy, bring all of what's going on into focus because it'll change how you live from this moment forward. In the passage that I read to you, out of Matthew chapter 16, and verses 13 through 19, we have what I would surely call a remarkable scene. Much debate around the ministry of Jesus, the growing crowds, who is he, the identity of this man of Galilee being debated in the courts, being debated in the centers of the local communities around the wells. Jesus confronts his disciples as to who they feel like he is, but then Jesus gives to them what I believe is the greatest prophecy that Jesus ever spoke. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and probably in 99 out of 100 churches that have scheduled to focus on Pentecost Sunday, most of them are going to go to the book of Acts. But the book of Acts is not the infancy of the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost really did not begin in the book of Acts when you understand Bible prophecy. The book of Acts spoke about the fulfillment of a supernatural impartation of Holy Ghost power that would empower the church. And the church, though it had its spiritual birthday and inauguration in Acts chapter 2. It was prophesied in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus said, I am going to build a church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There had never been a church. There had never been anything like a church. The only comparison would be the veiled reference of the rituals of the temple, but certainly not a church. But Jesus, as a legitimate Jew, honoring and recognizing the law and the temple, spoke to these 12 apostles whom he had raised up as the foundation of the church, and they didn't even understand that at this time. And Jesus reveals to them through a word of prophecy, I'm about to build a church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. There's three questions about the church age that every child of God needs to know for those of you who like to take notes and learn. Three things about the church age every believer needs to know. Number one is what is the church age? Number two, when did the church age begin? And number three, when did the church age end? The church was prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 16. He taught about it and laid down the foundations of it in his ministry and teachings by example. But prior to his ascension into heaven, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he had taught them previously, you are going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. 
And he gave them clear instruction. He basically had taught them all along. Don't preach, don't teach, don't start churches, don't do ministry, don't do anything until you've received the promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me, referring to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. After Jesus ascended into heaven, as was witnessed, somewhere between 500 and 614 people who physically saw Jesus and witnessed him alive after his resurrection, not only by biblical records, but by historic records, let me pause and tell you, Jesus Christ is not dead, he is alive. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Over 400 times in this Holy Bible, over 400 times in this Holy Bible, it promised us that Jesus will return. He's coming soon. And we're living on borrowed prophetic time. And so in obedience to the teachings of Jesus, before they did anything, they gathered in an upper room, the book of Acts tells us. Where were the masses? Where were the crowds? Where were the multitudes that he fed? Where were the hundreds that he healed? Where were all of those who heard him in regions around? Only 120, the Bible tells us, took the heart and the responsibility of his teaching seriously, but those 120 people changed the history of the world. God doesn't need your long list of accomplishments. He needs a surrendered heart and a spirit of humility. And 120 people gathered in the upper room, and the Bible says they were baptized in the Holy Ghost and spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave to them the utterance, as was witnessed by nations represented from all of the regions around. Don't miss this. That is when the church age began. The official inauguration and fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 16 was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. That brings us to the next question, when does the church age end? It ends with an event called the rapture of the church. The church age was inaugurated in the book of Acts chapter 2. The church age began there, but it will end at the rapture of the church. So the church age is a limited window of historic opportunity. God has given this planet and the population of this planet from the first century until now a limited opportunity. And the Bible said that the church age one day will end abruptly in the twinkling of an eye. That's why the Bible says in John's gospel in the ninth chapter, each of us must carry out the tasks that are assigned to us for night cometh when no man can work. The opportunity to do the work and the will of God is not a forever opportunity to be taken lightly. It is a limited opportunity with a holy beginning and a sacred ending and in between is the church age where we must do the work of God. By the way, the number one work of God was encapsulated in the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 where he said, I came to seek and to save the lost. There is no greater cause than winning the lost. There is no greater cause than reaching the unreached. There is no greater cause than local evangelism, regional evangelism, and global evangelism. That is the number one priority of the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
All churches that keep that as the lead member of the vision will always be prospered by the hand of God and underwritten by his supernatural provision. All churches that forget that will soon be forgotten and fold up like a dusty old barn as many in America have in the last year. I am so happy to be in a church that Pentecost Sunday is not something we celebrate once a year. But at Great Life Church, every Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Because listen, Pentecost, though many have tried to relegate it to a denominational title, Pentecost is not a denomination. Pentecost is an experience. An experience that every child of God should experience. It's not for an elite few. It's not just for people in the ministry. Every child of God should be baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Ghost in fire and exercise a supernatural language of prayer that has been afforded you by the shepherd of the church. I'm glad I'm in a church where if I feel like shouting, I can shout. Some churches I go to, if I were to stop while I was preaching and say, hallelujah, people get their kids and run for the back door. But the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hey. I don't mean to offend you. I love you. But not only is Jesus not dead, I'm not dead. Don't miss this. There is no greater cause than winning the lost. God didn't inaugurate the church and baptize it in the Holy Ghost and fire just to shout, just to sing, just to gather in our social clubs and dance and have a good time. You have been called to be a glorious witness and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it with excellence. Come on, shout amen. amen. The church age simply refers to a period of time when the church is here on this earth. Don't miss this. The next major prophetic event is an event called the rapture of the church. I'll probably preach on that in some form or fashion while I'm here. But it is the next major prophetic event. What is vitally important about the rapture of the church and commonly mistaught and misunderstood is the rapture is a signless event. There are no prophecies in the Bible that specifically address the timing of the rapture. In an hour in which you think not, the Son of Man cometh. The closest we can get is in Matthew 24, one of the great kingdom chapters of the Bible where Jesus is preaching about end time events. Many people quote Matthew 24 and verse 36. There the Bible says, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man cometh, know not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Speaking of the rapture, no man knows. It's a signless event. But some people take that to an extreme. They pull verse 36 out of Matthew chapter 24, but you have to read and study and interpret the Bible in full context. In other words, to understand the verse in Matthew 24 and verse 36, you really need to book the, read the entire book of Matthew. And the reason why there's so much bad teaching, false doctrine, and ignorance in the church is people pull one verse out of the Bible and use it as a support text to back up what they want to say for the next 45 minutes. 
And that's about the only Bible that you get. And the rest of it's what God showed him in a dream, what God told me in a vision, what I feel in my heart, what God revealed to me in a word of prophecy, what I prophesied over this church, what I prophesied over that church. Anybody whose personal interpretation overshadows the integrity of the Bible needs to be someone you watch with caution. Start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish in the Bible. And a lot of ministries since COVID have got themselves in hot water because they walked away from having the Bible as the guardrails of constraint upon their communication and spent too much time talking about presidents and politics and things in America. The Bible is not about America. The Bible is not about our president. The Bible is about Jesus Christ and the soon coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this preacher, pardon me while I preach, this preacher doesn't care one iota whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or a full-blown idiot. I love you, the Lord loves you, and Jesus died to save you. We need a purging of politics from the platform and a return to the Holy Bible. I'm going a whole lot higher than the White House. I'm going to the Holy House. And only God can make America great again. Now you know why the preacher takes the offering first. I'm on a divine assignment, and if you're the church, so are you. It is so much higher than political debate. It is so much higher than social debate. It is so much higher than the color of your skin. As long as I'm making people mad, let me make everybody in Florida mad. If you, listen, if you have to put a color or a title in front of lives matter, you're the racist. Jesus didn't die for white people. Jesus didn't die for black people. Jesus didn't die for yellow people. Jesus died for all people. Jesus died for all people. The blood that was shed was for all. And we got all these spineless preachers gutless wonders having little talk shows on social media tiptoeing around issues afraid to scare anybody or offend anybody give us men of God who have backbones like steel who love people enough and fear nothing but God one day I'm going to have to stand before almighty God and Bible prophecy tells me that all preachers of the gospel will stand before God with double judgment. Double judgment. All you that aren't called into ministry that are on social media claiming to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, you're no qualified for ministry than brain surgery. The minute you start calling yourself a minister, you're going to stand before God for double judgment. And the first thing you may face in double judgment is why did you lay your hands on a holy calling that I never called you to? You don't want to be in that place. I fear God. And because my God is holy, and because his Bible is perfect, and because Jesus is lovely, and because the gospel is pure, I fear no man on this earth.
I feel no repercussion on this earth. I fear no agenda on this earth. I just love you to tell you that the blood that Jesus shed was red and the red blood was for everybody. Red, white, blue, yellow, it doesn't matter. Everybody is somebody to Jesus. It is a far lesser debate for Christians to get involved in all of the social foolishness that our world is caught up in. I'm on kingdom business and I don't have time to play po political or social politics. I'm going to win men and women and boys and girls to Jesus and I'm going to open this holy Bible and preach it as God said it. If that's all right at Great Life Church, give the Lord a hand of praise. I close with this. The geography of the prophecy of Jesus is almost or equally important to the content of the prophecy. The geography. Where Jesus prophesied is almost equally important to what he prophesied because the Holy Spirit gave us the GPS location in the scripture. And all Bible is given to us by the Holy Ghost. Amen. And it's specifically pointed out in the region of Caesarea Philippi. As students of the Bible, we know, or if you don't know, you will know, there was something generationally unique about the location where Jesus said this. For outside the actual town in that region of Caesarea Philippi where Jesus took the disciples was a very notable, feared location of superstition. There was a very well-known rock hill, still is. I've been there. Outside of Caesarea Philippi, at the very base of that rock hill is a dark, cavernous opening. And for generations, people had taught that that cave was the literal entrance into Hades. For generations, it was the feared, cursed location. They spread it from family to family, from generation to generation. This is where Satan and all demon spirits they go in and out of Hades from this dark, frightful, cavernous opening. That's why it's translated in a modern English Bible, gates of hell. Because in the original language of that hour, Jesus referred to that location by its colloquialism. And theologians tell us that when Jesus spoke these words and prophesied the church, that he took the disciples there on purpose. Because there is no doubt that they, as little boys, had sat with their father and uncles and grandfathers around campfires, and just like we have stories of mysteries and ghosts and Bigfoot and Sasquatch, and bumps in the night that we have shared with our children and grandchildren, the disciples had sat around campfires hearing about the gates of hell where Satan and demons all go in and out. That's why nobody went anywhere near it. It was desolate. It was feared. It was ground believed to be cursed. Nobody went there. So the day that Jesus took the 12, his disciples were not on a picnic with Jesus on a day trip. He took them, what many theologians believe, to the very entrance to the cave. And it was at the cave that Jesus, and you must imagine the 12 disciples must have had hair bristling on the back of their neck the closer that they got because nobody had ever been there that they knew. They must have wondered at some point because they knew where it was. They must have wondered, where is he going? Why is he taking us there? I believe there's an answer to that question because Jesus never does anything in your life accidentally. 
That's why he said, he that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. If you're a born-again believer, you need to listen every day to the voice of God. You need to pay attention to what God is directing and asking of you. Because Jesus was about to prophesy their future. Because the 12 disciples were the foundation of the church. They were the 12 stones. 12 is a very important number of fullness in the Bible. 12 tribes of Israel. 12 stones, 12 apostles and so on. Very significant number in God's eyes. But there he took the 12 who were the foundation stones of the church. Before he could give them their future, they had to address their fear. You will never receive your future until you expel your fears. For faith is the work of God and not fear. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Spirit of fear in the Bible is literal. The word spirit is the same Greek word used throughout, translated most times as demons. God has not given us the demonic spirit of fear. Fear is a demonic power. And God hasn't given you fear. He has given you his word and out of his word he builds faith. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why you're not wasting your time right now listening to the Bible being taught, preached, and explained. Every time your pastor opens up the Holy Bible, every time I as your guest open up the Holy Bible, by the Holy Ghost and the anointing of the integrity of this book, there is something in the unseen world that's going out and being planted in mind, body, and spirit. There's even healing in the house today simply by the preaching of the word for he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions and diseases. So before they could enter into the prophecy of the future of the church, they had to expel the generational fears of family and influence and start with a pure slate don't miss it. Don't miss it. The church age began when? Acts chapter 2, the official inauguration, the fulfillment of the prophecy in Matthew 16. When does the church age end? The rapture of the church, which has not yet taken place, but I believe it'll happen much sooner than most of us realize. Don't miss it. Listen carefully. The greatest prophecy of Jesus I will build my church. That word build from the original Greek without going into a 30-minute teaching basically means forward and upward. It speaks of a guaranteed trajectory that once Jesus births the church, then he has prophesied and promised to build the church. That's why the true church during COVID didn't shut down. That's why churches that are now reopened have more people than before COVID. Why? Because no damn virus is going to stop the church of Jesus Christ. I had a church that had been in supporting Lost Lamb for years. Wrote me a two-page letter. We can no longer support your ministry because we heard you call COVID a damn virus. We have it on tape. I said, well, if you'd like multiple copies, I'd be happy to have the office send it to you. In case you didn't realize it, Damn is a biblical word that refers to anything cursed by God. And the last time I checked, sickness is cursed by God.
will work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. That's what the old Pentecostals used to sing. We'll work till Jesus comes. Why? Because they believe what I'm preaching. Jesus is not done. He's still building his church. And COVID has drawn a line in the sand to reveal to us the religiosity of dead churches that are no church and show to us the true church and the true men of God. If your pastor laid down and shut the church, thank God for that. It was God's clear sign to find another church. But if your pastor is fighting and kicking and screaming against every work of the devil to stop building the church, then you're in the right church. A real man of God is going to fight to keep the church open. A real man of God is going to keep preaching the gospel. A real man of God is going to keep reaching the lost. We're going to find a way, come hell or high water, to build the church of Jesus. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I haven't been here in two years. I forgot you people to make a man preach his full self to death. I hadn't seen the clock since 1223 and now I, I just saw it while y'all were shouting. Let me finish up and give you one gold nugget. Let me give you a solid gold nugget. How does this apply to you leaving church today as a born again believer? The church is not a facility. The church is not a denomination. The church is not a piece of real estate. Although I'll pause long enough to say that I disagree with all of those preachers who you've through the years heard say, this is just the building. We're the true church of Jesus Christ. Well, I know what they mean, but they're wrong. We are the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where they're wrong is this is not just a building. This is not just a piece of real estate in Florida. Because it was bought to be a church. Because it was built to be a church. Because it is functional as a church. It is then set apart and sanctified as holy ground. And when I hear... Preachers say it's just another commercial piece of real estate. I know they don't understand their Bible. Because the last time I checked, Paul sent out pieces of cloth that he had put on him while he was preaching. Acts 19, 11. And when people needed supernatural miracles to be healed and Paul couldn't use the internet or social media, he did worldwide evangelism by tearing his cloth in pieces and said, send this out to the sick. And signs and wonders and miracles were worked in the lives of people who just touched something that had been around the anointing of a true man of God. I'm not being arrogant when I say this. I believe there's a presence of God that saturates the building, saturates the chairs, saturates the carpet, saturates the parking lot. Demons are afraid of the property of God. Hey! And if you've repented of sin and received Jesus Christ, then you're a part of the true church. And because you're a part of the true church, then your trajectory, once you've turned from sin and turned to Christ, is guaranteed. What's the church age? Where did it begin? Acts chapter 2. Where does it end? The rapture of the church. We are in the church age now. You are a part of the true church because you are a part of the true church. God will build you. He'll build your faith. He'll build your health. He'll build your family. He'll build your business. He'll build your creativity. 
He'll build your IQ. Everything God touches grows. Everything God touches grows. Everything God touches grows. The first commandment of God, multiply. If you'll live a holy life, if you'll live in a way that your behavior is in agreement with the holy teachings of Jesus, from now until the rapture, everything you touch will grow. Because he said, I give to you the keys to the kingdom. The same anointing that rested upon Jesus, he shared with the church. He went as far as to say the things that you see me do. These same things will you do and greater things than these shall you do because I go to my Father which is in heaven. Every businessman within the sound of my voice Every businesswoman within the sound of my voice. In the last days, if you'll pay attention to the leading of the Spirit, if you'll live a holy life, if your goal will not be materialism, but the eternal kingdom of God, and there's nothing wrong with God blessing you with things on this earth, but I'm saying it's not the priority as to why you wake up in the morning. God is going to take you so far beyond what you thought he'd take you that it'll keep you on your knees for wisdom as to how to manage it. I prophesy in Jesus' name, God, in this church, because you have made a decision to come to a church that will not back up, will not back down, but has made evangelism and reaching the lost as its top priority. I prophesy an anointing in this church that God by the Holy Spirit at these very altars of prayer is going to release creative ideas for your own business. People who thought they'd never be a businessman or a businesswoman at this altar of prayer when you seek the Lord in tears and sincerity he is going to give you ideas for your own business. And in the last days, you're not going to be an employee. You're going to be an employer. And God will bless you if you walk humbly before the Lord. In Jesus' name. I'm not just saying that. By the Spirit of the Lord, I prophesy that. New ideas. Inventions. Colonel Sanders didn't start Kentucky Fried Chicken until he was in his 60s. You're not too old. Psalm 1, even in their old age, their leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever they doeth shall prosper. Your provider is not Social Security. Your provider is Jehovah Jireh. Dream a little bigger. Think a little bigger. Speak a little bigger. I will build the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. Say it. The gates of hell will not prevail in my life. Now give the Lord a mighty shout. Hey, hey, hey. Stand to your feet with me, please. Thank you so much for your patience this morning. I never apologize for preaching the word of God. But in a day and age in which people prefer sermonettes for Christianettes who've got to get home to their dinette sets and smoke their cigarettes and watch their TV sets, I appreciate a church where people love the B-I-B-L-E. May it be said in a way that pleased the Lord. He started in the Bible. He stayed in the Bible. He finished in the Bible. Now heads bowed. Lord, as you see fit, if the words preached 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I ask you now by the Holy Spirit to answer the prayer I begin with. Convict of sin and call people to Jesus Christ. Not by the pleading of men, not by the coercion of men, but by the gentle tug of the Holy Spirit. Speak into the ear clearly and tell that person listening to me, today is your day to walk away from the curse of sin and be joined to the blessing of God. Today is your day to turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Jesus. By the Holy Spirit, I ask you, bypass all my feeble efforts. Bypass all of my shortcomings. Bypass all of my inabilities. And have mercy upon those who need you. Speak to the backslidden. Speak to those who claim to be Christians but only live it part time. Speak to those who have allowed the carnality of the world, of secularism, of sensuality, of blatant perversion through social media to constantly bombard their eye gates and they've become comfortable with it. And they have it like dessert every day. And if Jesus were to come, they'd be left behind. They're not living in victory over sin, but sin is living in victory over them. Have mercy. Call them to an altar of repentance today. In Jesus' name. Let me ask you what I believe is life's most important question. Where you spend eternity depends upon your answer to this question, so listen carefully. Can you clearly remember a time in your life when you got down on your knees in prayer, repented of your sins, and invited Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life? The Bible tells us in John chapter 3 and verse 3, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. God's Word says all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious standard. No matter how good a life we try to live, we still fall miserably short of being a good person. We all fall short of God's desire for us to be holy. In his very first message, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will also perish. That word perish means that we will face the judgment of God for our sins when we die. The word repent means to turn your back on sin and turn your heart towards God. It's like a U-turn. You have been walking in your own direction, led by your own desires and will, but now you are willing to turn to God and follow His will and His desires. Becoming a true Christian is not merely believing some doctrine or going to church on Sunday. Becoming a Christian is a personal and deliberate decision that you alone can make. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door of your life and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. You see, Christ is a gentleman. He will never knock the door down and force his way into your life. He knocks gently and waits for you to say, Come in or stay out. What are you going to say today? Why don't you make that decision with me right now in prayer? Prayer is simply talking to God from a sincere heart. Jesus has promised that he will not turn away anyone who comes to him in faith. So let's do that together. Will you pray this prayer with me out loud and without shame? Dear God, today I humble my heart before you in prayer. In childlike faith, I repent of my sins and trust in your mercy and forgiveness. The Bible says that if I confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, 
that I would be saved. So today I confess that Jesus is Lord, and in my heart I believe that he is risen. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and give me the strength to live for you. Thank you for your love for me. Now according to your word, today I am saved. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh mm-hmm. 